That's not the right. So we're just about to make a start um, once I, or once Shane finds the agenda slides. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> so this is the second APOP session. Um, um, so I'm your chair, Philip Smith, looking after this session. Um, we have three speakers, as I mentioned this morning. Um, so we have three APOP sessions. Really what I want to do is pull up the agenda slides to remind you about lightning talks. Um, so those take place on Thursday, um, 4 p.m. to 5.30. Light relief after the policy seat. So once we've all had our deep and meaningful discussions about um, APNIC address policy, um, we can have a bit of light relief talking about fun and interesting things um, that we have seen or discovered recently on the network. I think we've had five submissions so far. Um, we need eight altogether. It's not saying it's first come, first serve, but the first eight that the PC like the most will be the ones that get on the agenda on Thursday. Um, there isn't really a deadline as such, but um, the sooner the better would be appreciated. We'll probably make a decision tomorrow by lunchtime um, if we if we get suitable submissions. Um, so Dean Pemberton, who's um, the PC chair, one of the PC chairs um, has arrived. So I guess we'll be in a position to make some kind of decision tomorrow lunchtime. So anyway, there's the URL if you'd like to submit. Um, we look forward to hearing from you. Now, this afternoon, we have these presentations. So first up, we have the BGP monitoring protocol testing that was done at Janok. Um, so it's actually going to be done in two presentations, the first one presenting what it's about and the second one presenting the results. Um, second one is talking about um, internet, what is actual internet speed um, from Sungo Lee. And then to finish off the day, we have Paul Vixi who will be talking about passive DNS collection and analysis. So, um, I would like to invite Shishio up, please. Um, I'll leave it to you to hand over to, yeah, to your co-presenter when the time comes. So the, the team there will swap the slides over um, as need be. All right, thank you. Okay. Is it ready? Oops, sorry. How to share and SMS? How to, uh, uh, yeah, this one. Okay. It's only by the. No, you, you just use the keyboard. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Hi, uh, I'm a Cisco chair, consulting system engineer over Cisco System Japan. Today, I and Taiji san, who is an engineer over Big Group, uh, will introduce uh, our activity and uh, community effort to the APNIC participant. Uh, presentation title are a little bit modified. Uh, the title is BMP BGP monitoring protocol testing by Janoga. Janoga is uh, Japanese English, uh, means uh, uh, Japan Network Operators Group members. Yeah, this is uh, today's agenda. I, at first, I will explain what is BMP. And after that, uh, Taiji san uh, explained uh, our test result summary. After that, uh, he will explain the 
what happened after January 34? Yeah, what is the BMP? BMP is BGP monitoring protocol. It, it is discussed in the IT Grow Working Group. It can monitor BGP adjacency lives in, uh, adjacency lives in and processing routing information from BGP peers. BMP is focused on the monitoring of BGP status, route, and events. This figure shows the BGP protocol sequence, and BGP, sub, uh, BGP router received the BGP update from a peer, and uh, the routing information base is called adjacency lives in. After that, uh, BGP router uh, execute policy like a filter and a root map, and then the, uh, then the local rib will be ma made. And the BGP router update to the another peer local rib based information. And BMP can both local rib and the adjacent rib. Uh, BMP can monitor lo uh, both local rib and adjacent rib in. So, what is the benefit of a BMP? BMP reach adjacency lived in, so operator can check consistency of a policy, like a root map, and the BMP will be easier than today's BGP monitoring system, and the operator can find reason of a disconnection from a BMP peer down message, and we can know capability negotiated to Hold on time over BGP peer from BMP peer up message. And it would be the unified user interface without any show command and debug command on the various vendors. A BMP has a six type, type of message. A type zero is a root monitoring. It used to for initializing synchronization of adjacency lived in. Uh, type 1 is a static report. It monitoring station to observe interesting events that occur on the router. Type 2, uh, peer down notification. It indicates BGP peer session was terminated. The message includes reason code from BGP notification message. Type 3, peer up notification. It indicates that peering session has coming up. The message includes remote, local TCP port, and open message. Type 4, initiation message. It informs the monitoring station of its vendor, software version, and so on. Type 5 is a termination message. It indicates why BMP termination, terminating a session. This is detailed information of a type two static report. You can find, uh, uh, you can find uh, BMP, uh, uh, detailed information of BGP event, so, because uh, BMP can reach adjacency lived in. And uh, type seven uh, shows number of, uh, total number of root in the adjacency lived in. Type eight uh, shows number of root in the local rib. And also, type two static report has an extension. If you'd like to uh, know the, some extension, then the, you can uh, use uh, from number nine and uh, so on. Uh, this is the life cycle of a BMP. A B, BMP can work uh, individually from a BGP session. Um, BMP, BMP session established then the BMP router send to the initiation message to the server, uh, to uh, initiation message to the server. After that, uh, if uh, B BG BMP router has a BGP session, then the BMP router send to the peer up notification. After that, uh, BMP router send to the routing monitoring to synchronize the adjacency lives in. And uh, BMP router send to the static report uh, to inform an uh, interesting event. And if a BGP session will be down, 
Then the BMP router send to the peer down notification. And also BMP session will be down. Then the BMP, BMP router send to the termination message to the server. This is implementation report from IETF Grow mailing list on the, on the end of last year. Uh, Juniper already supported uh, BMP version one, but uh, they, uh, they, they will support BMP version three from 13.3. Uh, and the Quaker also supported, and our uh, routers, iOS and uh, iOS XE, XE uh, will support it, uh, BMP uh, draft 07, which is, uh, which, which uh, BMP version is a uh, version three uh, since 3.11 is. Extra BGP will support draft 07. As a server implementation, uh, Google BMP receiver already supported BMP, but the version still uh, one. Okay, uh, my section is ended, so I'll pass the ball to the Taj. Hi, I'm Tajit Chia from Biglob, a well-known ISP in Japan. Uh, I'm network engineer, our responsibility for uh, design and operation of our backbone. backbone. Uh, so uh, last spring, uh, we took interest in BMP and uh, together with companies, GRI and uh, Cisco, and began testing uh, its implementation. Today, I'd like to talk about the BMP test result. First of all, uh, our company's background and uh, our motivation to use BMP. Uh, Biglob is an ISP in Japan. Uh, we have three million subscribers. Uh, we have several pubs in Asia and the US, and we connect with uh, over 150 uh, ASAs globally. Uh, in daily operation, we use a syslog and uh, a SMNP to detect network trouble, but in the case of uh, the, in the case of the uh, BGP issue, uh, the operator more often use a uh, router CLI to search the problem. So uh, our primary goal is to be able to detect BGP trouble and investigate, investigate quickly. To regards to uh, GRI uh, is uh, one of the biggest social game provider in the mobile phone market. Uh, they hope more oriented towards routing optimization to enhance the user experience. For example, uh, they want to show, uh, they want to know the uh, troubleshoot convergence time and the latency. Cisco, uh, as you know, uh, the biggest network device vendor. Uh, they want to know the uh, operator's needs and get feedback for future development. Uh, prior to our testing, uh, we surveyed the current environment of BMP. Juniper was actually the first major vendor to implement BMP. The Juniper uh, MX3 router had already implemented BMP uh, version one a few years ago. Uh, Cisco started supporting, supporting BMP sometimes last year. Next, uh, we, track, we talk about uh, software implementation of BMP. Uh, we find uh, two open source software, BMP Receiver and the uh, BMP2. Uh, BMP Receiver was uh, developed by Google engineer involved in writing the internet draft for uh, BMP. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Fohamed uh, BMP2 uh, was developed by a former Cisco engineer. Unfortunately, uh, their exi existing open source software did not support BMP version 3. Luckily, uh, Cisco was able to provide us uh, with internal tool for testing. Uh, this is our network topology. Uh, we connect, uh, connect with uh, BigLob and Cisco's test level, and we develop network environment of 
EBGP and IBGP. So we use a uh, router of uh, AS, uh, ASR1000 and uh, MX960. So BMP server receives the BGP information from uh, ASR and MX. Uh, this is a test environment. Uh, we gathered and uh, uh, we have tested uh, in Cisco Tokyo office. Oh, sometimes seriously and sometimes relaxing, uh, we, we have tested. This is so nice ice cream. Uh, if you have any chance, you should uh, eat cold stone ice cream. Okay, okay, now I'd like to talk about the test result. Uh, this is a uh, result of running inbound filtering. This situation is uh, MX, uh, MX router receives uh, uh, 80 loads from a uh, remote router and uh, cuts down the loads uh, by inbound filtering. According to BMP server log, uh, we could find the difference the difference the number of the routes uh, between agency living and the local lives. Next is situation of uh, oh, sorry. Uh, next situation is a uh, down BGP session by remote router. Uh, the MX router runs a uh, clear BGP command, and so uh, we saw these behaviors. So as you can see, uh, we could find uh, a peer down message along with the uh, message of the uh, down reason. As you said, uh, administrative, uh, administrative reset. In, some, in similar way, we tried to down the BGP session by local router. Uh, ASR router runs the <coughs> interface shutdown command and so uh, we, we saw the behavior, and so we could find the local system closed session by holding time. Next slide is a test of BGP session caused by, uh, uh, BGP session down caused by max prefix down on MX1960. Uh, sorry. Okay, this situation is uh, uh, MX router receives uh, uh, 80 routes, uh, but, uh, but uh, MX set uh, uh, 50 routes of max prefix, uh, then BGP session down. So we could find a down state status and the reason caused by max prefix. On the other hand, uh, in case of the max prefix on ASR1000, uh, so we could find a different result with MX router. Uh, this situation completely same as previous tests without routers. Uh, so BMP server logs show the unclear message. In, in our survey, uh, this case by uh, support, not, not to support the RFC 4486, uh, this defined the BGP sees notifications on ASR1000. Uh, Cisco said uh, ASR1000 supported from uh, S iOS XR 3.30. So if you want to use a BMP function, you should pay attention for uh, this RFC, uh, not only BMP. Finally, we will summarize the test result. Uh, we are able to successful implementation BMP and see how we could benefit from its use. Uh, BMP is uh, so useful uh, because uh, it allows the uh, uh, operators to obtain variable information that previously required the debug command and the router login. Uh, most Japanese ISP forbids the uh, use, uh, use of debug command because of the high CPU usages. It helps us troubleshoot complex outages. In addition, uh, the data gathered, be, be, uh, sorry, uh, gathered is based on uh, RFC-defined standards, so the output is uh, consistent uh, among various vendors. Uh, next, uh, we will summarize the current uh, implementation of uh, BMP. Regarding, uh, regarding supported routers, uh, in recent implementations, Juniper and the Cisco's router uh, supported BMP version 3. And so, in addition, we, uh, we are hoping more vendors will support BMP. 
As for the uh, server-side software, uh, it lacked the uh, server-side software was, uh, was compatible with BMP version 3. We need a Superman. So lastly, I talk about my recent activity promoting uh, BMP in Japan. Uh, journal meeting held in Takamatsu in July. Uh, its attendance is uh, over 500, uh, one of the biggest network operators event in Japan. Uh, we presented uh, about this uh, BMP test result. We got positive comment from operators. They are also take interested interesting to uh, troubleshoot without debug command. In addition, we will report uh, IETF IDL and uh, Grow Working Group about the gap between operator's expectation on the, and the uh, vendor's implementation. We have two points, uh, timestamp and uh, security. So, uh, so next, uh, we found we found the uh, implementation update. Uh, after January 34, uh, some software engineers has been working on uh, developing BMP servers. Uh, NTT r and uh, Isida-san published the BMP version 3 software named uh, Liu BMP Server. Okay, finally, we will talk about the future plan. Uh, Regarding to uh, BMP, uh, we will try further testing for uh, uh, installation of our network. Uh, in addition, we are developing uh, automa automation tool triggered by BMP message for uh, our daily operation. As for without BMP, uh, we will find other new uh, useful technologies. We want to find and uh, test new technology with general operators. Okay, uh, okay, that's my presentation will be end. So uh, I'd like to turn out the Q and A. Okay. Right, thank you very much. Uh, questions, please. Surely there must be questions. This is again another topic that had a lot of discussion on the program committee mailing list. <laughs> yes, <laughs> a lot of questions. So. Okay, Sunny. Thanks. Um, I just want to ask: um, Was the testing with BMP with V6 enabled, or was it just V4? Mm. Was the testing with IPv4 as well? <laughs> uh, IPv4 and IPv6. Yes, uh, we tested the IPv6 also, but uh, yeah, we we tested the IPv4 and IPv6. And and the prefix. Um, uh, one of the uh, testing was the yeah, pre but, but, but uh, yes, uh, yeah. we confirmed the IPv4 capability and IPv6 capability, but we did not uh, test it uh, IPv6 max uh, max prefix. Okay, that's the curious part I yeah. was wondering about. Okay, thank you. Right. Are there any other questions? If not, thank you both very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. So next up we have Sung Lee from NTT Communications, who's going to be talking about what is actual internet speed. Um, thank you, Pete. Um, Okay. Um, good afternoon. Um, well, I've been uh, working as an IP engineer for the last uh, three years. In other words, um, my job is pretty much about internet. And um, uh, while working on my role, I noticed that a um, lot of people um, don't understand much about internet, and um, honestly, including me. And uh, I also noticed um, experienced uh, network engineers, like um, with uh, tenuous um, the industry experience, and also with um, uh, higher the vendor certificate, like CCIE. 
and uh, don't understand the what the internet uh, speed they can expect when it comes to uh, internet. So, um, which is very interesting. So the um, I came up with this topic, and um, I hope you find this interesting as well. So let me begin. Okay, I just um, let me skip the content. Okay. Um, well, uh, there are two words uh, making confusion: the speed and bandwidth. The speed and bandwidth um, has different meaning, but I found, I noticed that uh, those two words are used interchangeably. And um, so the, I would say when you um, make contract with um, ISP to get an IP transit service from an ISP, that is uh, bandwidth. Uh, it is not a internet the speed. In um, in other words, the the ISP can guarantee the the contracted um, data flow rate per second between your site and um, the ISP's uh, backbone side they cannot guarantee uh, the contracted um, the data flow rate per second between a de specific destination on the internet and your site. The reason for that is, um, is simple, because it is internet. Internet which is comprised of the the thousand of ISPs just in the US. Well, I tried to find the, how many ISPs um, in the Asian Pacific, but I couldn't find any the document. So I hope the APNIC published those kind of documents share and with us in the future. Okay, um, so the most of our customers, especially the um, enterprise customers, do this. Google to find the a service providing the um, internet um, the speed test. And then the, they get this kind of a result. And then they pick up the phone and ring us and complain. Well, uh, this kind of service is uh, uh, pretty much um, inaccurate. Well, I'm gonna um, share the, um, my experience, which shows the, um, the reason. Okay, um, <clears throat> uh, there are main three factors uh, affecting the internet speed. The traffic congestion and uh, increased the latency in a specific application the customer is using. And um, I list up the, some possible causes uh, from my uh, the experience, which is a real um, cases. And some of them is very uh, clear, as the name stands for the usage increase. Definitely, there's going to be traffic congestion. And the uh, faulty device at an ISP, yeah, definitely generate the traffic congestion. And, but I pick up the sum of them to go through the details to um, help you understand the, what is the, the, the factors that are affecting the internet speed and also get more understanding of the internet speed. Um, it, is, it is not quite open, but um, there are cases, some um, customers um, experience a sudden internet speed decrease due to the unexpected huge malicious traffic. And um, the, the malicious traffic may come from the internet 
or arise inside the customer's land side, consuming the one bandwidth. And um, when a malicious traffic comes from the internet, the, what we do as an ASP is um, to put a specific filter to, uh, into a backbone to make our backbone clear. It is not just for a specific customer. It is um, kind of make the, our whole backbone side clear from this kind of a malicious traffic. And if the customer has a traffic, uh, the, the, uh, the malicious traffic is coming from their land side, then we uh, try to help the customer to identify the, the IP addresses, specific IP addresses, the compromised, so that they can take the further steps to uh, remove this kind of the um, uh, condition issue. Well, this is one of the, um, our ISP, the customers, which was affected by the NTP reflection attack only this year. Well, and also I noticed recently um, our customer the, um, uh, experienced some kind of the, uh, the new attack, which is a simple service discovery protocol attack. In internet um, can be thought of as uh, interconnections between ISPs. Um, so, which means ISPs make uh, private and public uh, peering between them to give the better internet experience for their customers. And um, which is definitely make their customers feel the better internet speed. And so there is a possibility that the, the traffic congestion could happen the, at the peering point. This is one of the example that the real example, uh, one, of, one of our customer reported um, this issue to us. So the, the customer is multi-home, so the customer has a, a upstream with us, which is NTT communications and the customer has another upstream with the Tesla. And um, as you can see, the, the left-hand side, the pass one, the AS pass is shorter than the pass two on the right-hand side. So the, pass, the AS pass one is supposed to be faster and uh, preferable, the, the preferable the route for the customer. So I guess the customer um, choose that pass or automatically the BGP is select that pass. But because of the, the congestion at a, uh, the peer point with the entity communications and uh, um, the, the China network communications, the, they're shown in red. So, um, Interestingly, that congestion happened just during the peak business hour. So um, how do we manage this situation as an ISP is um, we officially spoke to the other peer and um, to increase the, the peer bandwidth. This is how to resolve the issue. Okay. Um, now I uh, pick up some factors related with the latency. Uh, the physical distance between uh, source and uh, destination could be a cause for speed uh, decrease. Well, uh, this is, is common sense because um, the longer the distance, the more time you need to travel around. So that applies to the internet, the physical pass as well. So, however, the I noticed the um, the the internet user, our customers, uh, forget to consider this fact. So, well, there is a, the 
Well, actually, the, uh, our one customer that um, the a new customer is complaining about the new internet, the IP20 service, and uh, the customer, um, the situation is like this. Uh, the customer uh, need to access, I guess, a server in Europe. And uh, the normal round trip latency is around 300 milliseconds from the Australia all the way to um, Europe. And um, the specific application the customer is using um, does not seem to be designed for that latency. So the, we explain this specific situation and ask the customer to um, work around the, the issue using other method instead of the, using the application. Anyway, the, finally the customer um, happy with our support. And uh, the, the picture shown here is uh, simple, the, um, the simulation that I made to show how to increase the latency is affect the internet speed. In asymmetric routing is could be another factor, the causing uh, latency decrease. Well, the asymmetric routing is simply say in internet uh, a routing situation where the outbound AS pass uh, to the destination is different from the inbound pass from that specific destination. So simply it's going around instead of coming back to the same the pass. Well, asymmetric routing is, a, is not a problem when it comes to internet because um, routing policy of each ISP is different. And um, in normal situation, asymmetric routing does not cause any issue as um, as we try to do their best to um, own routing policy for their customer. However, in some situation, in some cases, a routing policy chain made in one another, the ISP could affect the other, the ISP's customers' experience. Well, I've seen this case once. Well, this, well, the green dotted line uh, was a normal AS pass uh, between source and destination, but somehow the uh, the AS pass changed it. So, the, as you can see, as a, a dotted line in red, it go around U.S. and coming back Australia. And we did some analysis and find that the, the one of the tier two is um, providing the um, IP20 service to the destination is um, made some policy changes against the tier one. Uh, we don't know why, because uh, it's their decision. So, how do we handle this situation? Because uh, basically, um, this is out of our control. We can't say anything about the policy of other ISP. It's their decision, pretty much. And, but uh, we explain the situation to the other ISP, and then uh, they notice that it, it may affect the, their customer as well. So, we try to get the cooperation, and uh, that's how we solve the problem. And also, maybe the customer or our customer, if they a, if, uh, get a service from the other tier two, uh, the, the IP transit omnic service, then we, we ask the customer, talk to the, the other ISP, so that they can change whatever do for you or the internet experience. That's how we handle the situation. And submarine cable cut, it happened time to time. 
uh, around a year. And there's an interesting report about why the cable could happen, but it's out of this topic, so I don't mention it. Well, the situation, yeah, definitely, absolutely, that makes the latency increase a lot until the cable cut uh, result. And this is uh, the, one of the real example that happened early this year, and one of our customers complained about the, the, the huge latency about the route to the China. So this, this kind of case, we uh, explain the situation to customer and then we keep updating. And I have been talking about the network side and let's have a look at the application side. Um, he, here is a real example. The, this customer is um, getting 100 meg BPS um, the IP transit service from us. But um, one day the customer came to us and complained that I can only 16 or 17 megabps on the 100 megabps, which is uh, uh, ridiculous. And so we check our side, which means the network and routing, what's wrong with that? And then the, we found that the customer is using one TCP IP based the, uh, the application. That's the problem. So the, with, with this um, simulation, and then show the result to the customer, that is exactly matched with the uh, bandwidth usage of the customer. So the, Basically, the uh, TCP-based uh, the application is using um, the well the TCP window size and the latency is um, play a big role um, uh, to limit the actual the application's uh, bandwidth limit, regardless of the how many the network bandwidth they got. So customer didn't know about that fact. Uh, I guess the bottom one is broken, and well, but anyway, the, there's a luckily slash at the end. Uh, the speed, uh, from what I mentioned, the this is kind of the um, the summary. The what is the internet speed? The I would say the is proportional to bandwidth, so you get the better speed if you get more bandwidth. You get better speed if you use um, well-designed application for the situation, and you get better speed if you got a less latency. So the Before blaming your ISP, so I think uh, it's better to do some kind of the this the work, and which is um, is then check the is there any bandwidth congested internally or one side, or is there any asymmetric routing, or is there any sudden speed decrease after introducing a new application or any speed decrease for a specific destination. So the tool is simple, the, um, the ping and the trace route, it shows everything. What we do as an ISP when, when hearing issues from our customer is um, we request uh, the trace route result with the specific source and destination, uh, destination IP address. And based on that, we also check the, any outage related with the issue. Then we report that customer. 
And um, we check also any symmetric routing in the internet globally. And also we check the uh, security issue like leaders. And then we do, we take any necessary action in the security team. And if, no, if there is no issue found in our backbone site in the global network, then we explain the situation. It could be happened in your specific situation. As I mentioned in the first slide, the, um, the, as a customer, um, don't Google and um, check the internet speed on a, one of the internet speed testing service instead. You better to uh, ask the, the ISP to get a, the access line test, which shows the, the test result between the your site and the uh, ISP, the backbone site. And also, if, if you want to, then you just do a quick FTP protocol, uh, FTP, um, the downloading test using the FTP protocol. So I normally uh, recommend to use the micro MSN. I guess um, they have a big bandwidth for their customer. And, um, we entity communications run the IPERP server globally, so we sometimes uh, the ask the ask customer to run an IPERP client so that we can the uh, provide the the kind of testing environment. And um, also the bandwidth, well bandwidth you can easily upgrade, but the the latency. Um, could be a critical factor because um, uh, for your specific business uh, requirement. So um, I recommend that instead of the go with a specific ISP, better to visit the ISP's um, looking glass or route server, whatever, and then check the global latency and uh, the latency all the way to a specific destination of your concern. Yeah. That's, that's, that's it from me, yeah. So I hope you get the, the meaning of the, what is the internet speed is. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Are there questions at all? So the, the issues you've talked about here in the presentation, these are primarily coming through NTT support with customers, or your own experiences separate from that? Um, it's not just from my private experience. It's coming from our the company, the operation okay. experience. No, it's very interesting. It's, it's very rare that I find these sort of things being expressed in an open forum. A lot of network operators kind of keep a lot of their troubleshooting yeah. and how they work with customers and customers' experiences very much to themselves. So yeah. it's, it's good to see something like this. I mean, more of this type of troubleshooting and so right. forth, I find interesting and useful. So. Yeah, it's interesting, yeah. yeah. Paul. Oh. Hi, I'm Paul Vixie, Farsight Security. Thank yep. you for your presentation. Um, you make mention of path symmetry with regard to performance. And I, I have always found intuitively that path symmetry is going to dictate the performance of TCP. Yep. But I'm wondering if you have characterized and measured this, uh, or is, is this an anecdote? OK. Um, you're talking about the asymmetric the routing. Yeah, the, well, the view we are see is I think it's a bit different from what the other, the server side or the small, the LAN side is different because um, we, we see just the BGP routing globally. So the AS pass is the, our main concern. We don't really look at the application side because we are the IP transit service provider. So AS pass is the, um, the thing that we, when you're talking about the asymmetric routing, not about any the the 
TCP or UDP, whatever it is. Yeah. Thank you. I think I go. New author. All right. Thank you very much for that. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up on the stage, we have Paul Vixi, who will be talking about passive DNS collection and analysis. Hello. Um, thank you all for coming. Not very many people in the room. Um, I guess the weather is real nice out there. So we've been collecting passive DNS traffic for um, seven years now in my team. Uh, and it was originally, uh, this work was inspired by Florian Weimar, uh, who, in my opinion, really invented passive DNS collection, which he called DNS logging. Um, we have changed our approach several times, and we're changing it again. And the exact reasons for that, I think, are instructive to anyone working in this field. Also, our work is largely open source and uh, may help some of you get started if you're interested in, in, in working on this type of thing. So, um, every network flow, more or less, starts with a DNS transaction. So, uh, every click of the mouse, every object you fetch as part of a web page, every email message um, is gonna cause one or more DNS transactions, which will then direct uh, various clients and servers to reach each other uh, as, as directed by the content of DNS. And so to the extent that you want to know uh, why your network is doing what it's doing, you, you're interested in uh, characterizing the motives behind what you see in NetFlow or even PCAP, uh, you need to look at DNS. So uh, I, I have sometimes characterized the internet as a territory and the DNS as the map of that territory. Um, so the question is not, you know, is it important or why is it important, but uh, how can we get it done in a way that's relatively straightforward, simple, standardized, and non-disruptive? Uh, because historically, when you turn on logging in your DNS server in order to find out sort of what questions did it receive, maybe even find out what answers it sent, uh, you will immediately slow your uh, DNS server down to the point where it is missing queries. Uh, it turns out that DNS is a UDP-based protocol. UDP is extremely fast. It doesn't have any connection set up or tear down. Uh, you can do a DNS transaction in very little time with no state held by either side, and that means you can do quite a few of them, and none of that is true of your file system. Um, so even on a modern computer with a SSD-based file system, you cannot write to a file uh, in the same order of magnitude of speed that you can answer DNS. So. Um, if you have to make a choice where uh, you'd like to log everything, uh, but if you log everything, you'll slow down and miss traffic, then that's the wrong choice. Uh, any trade-off between the reliability of your DNS responses and the latency uh, versus keeping a complete log of everything that you answered has to be, uh, that trade-off has to be settled in the direction of DNS service. It is much better to lose your log file content and miss some transactions uh, or to, to, to answer some transactions that you can't necessarily keep uh, a record of versus keeping a record of everything at the expense of not answering everything. So success in this area, and this was true for Florian Weimar's work as well as a couple generations of our work, has all, all come in the form of PCAP. This is Berkeley packet filter stuff, so it's the same interface that TCP dump uses. Um, and the benefit of this is that you're looking at packets on the wire, and if you are not able to watch those packets as fast as they're going by, then, well, you, you lose. And that's what I said was important. If you can't keep up, then you want your logging to fail, not your service. 
Um, so in 2006, I developed something called NCAP that was meant to replace PCAP, um, and it looked only for the authoritative responses. Uh, the only innovation in this case was that it would reassemble authoritative responses that had been fragmented uh, due to eDNS. Um, and it was cool stuff. Uh, no, no question that in 2006 this was uh, innovative. On the other hand, it had any number of design flaws. So in 2009, another member of my team rewrote it all as something called nMessage. Um, and one of the big things that he did was to look for the query that would precede a response. Um, my system, the NCAP system, uh, w was willing to accept poison if you sent a response uh, that it would see, uh, and that response was not actually solicited by any query, then you could end up poisoning our system. You can't poison the end message system in that way because it will only keep track of responses uh, to queries that it has seen. Uh, and it also logs complete DNS transactions, so it has the additional benefit of keeping track of the total transaction time, number of retries, that kind of thing. Um, and so the current passive DNS system at Farsight Security, which I consider really to be the state of the art, is based on nMessage. But nMessage also has some problems. Um, I want to say, because uh, Edward Snowden has uh, made some disclosures about uh, national security interest in personally identifiable information, that we don't have any personally identifiable information in our passive DNS collection system. Neither did Florian Weimar. In this picture, you see stub resolvers at the bottom talking to recursive servers, and in those conversations, there is PII, um, which is why we don't place our sensor in that location. Uh, if a recursive server is asked something it doesn't know and has to go upstream, uh, that's where it will cross a wire that we will view. And so we will see a transaction between the recursive and the authority server, uh, but that will not contain any end user IP address. And so we think it is uh, re relatively respect respectful of end user privacy. Uh, so we collect that data, we share it in real time with these uh, academic and operational security research communities, both. Uh, the nonprofit and the commercial uh, ends of that uh, community. And we also make some products of our own out of it. Uh, for example, the Passive DNS database that I'll probably give a short talk about during lightning talks on Thursday. Um, but in any case, this is how our system works and it's representative. If you're doing passive DNS collection, this is how you should do it. Uh, you, you should ideally not collect those uh, PII transactions below the recursive. So as I mentioned, there are some problems with the nMessage approach. Um, and chief among them is that it won't see certain things that don't appear on the wire. It is, after all, a BPF application. It's looking at packets on the wire. And uh, if something is happening inside your DNS server that does not show on the wire, like, for example, a cache purge or cache expiration event, that might be something that's very important to you in order to characterize why your network behaved the way it did, uh, but there won't be any evidence that we see. Um, also, we are uh, trying to, we, there are some things we have to guess. If you have a given authority name server that's responsible for both apnic.net and, I don't know, corp.apnic.net, some, some subdomain, uh, if we see a transaction, we don't necessarily know what role the server had when it was answering that particular request. Uh, the server knew, but uh, we don't necessarily know. Also, uh, we're lazy. We did not implement the TCP reassembly portion of all of this. So uh, any transaction that uh, results in truncation in UDP and has to fail, fall back to TCP will be um, invisible to us. Uh, so for these three reasons, we decided that we would push forward into yet another version of uh, collection technology. Been working on this a little more than 18 months, and uh, the results are quite good so far. Uh, DNS tap is server embedded, so this is not an on-the-wire collector the way NCAP and nMessage are, or the way that uh, Florian Weimar's system worked. Um, and the output from the DNS tap software that is embedded in your server is a TCP stream, uh, which is a mixed blessing because TCP is reliable and could 
unless we manage it very carefully, cause your server to block while trying to save the telemetry and thus not answer every query put to it. Uh, so we, we do manage that very carefully. Um, all of the events are tagged. All of the metadata is explicit. There's no guessing. And of course, uh, that means we have the ability to log things that don't appear on the wire. So you can now watch your cache uh, much more carefully uh, than before. Uh, this is all open source licensed. This is the general architecture. And the only thing that's really important in a talk that is going to be as short as this one is that uh, these are, there are two threads represented here. And the circular queue in the, uh, the main thread, which is where the DNS is actually uh, being answered in your server, uh, that circular queue is allowed to overflow. So if the uh, data path from the DNS tap uh, receiver to the log file is sl too slow, uh, and you're going to be losing data because it just will not fit in the data path that you have to your persistent storage, uh, the loss will occur as close as possible to the DNS worker thread. In other words, it's uh, reliable front loss. So uh, this is, uh, it's important whenever you have uh, predictable congestion in your network that you manage that and, and that your congestion happen exactly where and when and how you decide that it should rather than just being some sort of side impact uh, of your design. Um, so the, the congestion here is extremely well planned. Um, so I mentioned it's server, it's server embedded. Uh, so we have some open source files that we donate to each server vendor that uh, more or less glues their main code base into our middleware. And um, so far, it's the, the server vendors that we have offered it to have taken it. Um, so we don't have the problem of reassembling UDP fragments. We don't have the problem of trying to reassemble TCP streams. Uh, it's just generally better. Uh, and it works fine in Unbound right now, and it works fine in the Knot server, which is from CZNIC. Uh, we did not implement it in Bind because I used to be the Bind guy, and I wanted to make clear to the world that um, Bind is not our primary platform, uh, as it once was. Uh, but uh, the folks at ISC have said that they would take it if we offered it to them. So I expect that we will see it in NSD and bind this year. I'm not sure about power DNS. Um, so I mentioned uh, it's a TCP output stream. So it's a reliable uh, byte stream between the server that runs our embedded code and the receiver that actually processes the data and logs it. Uh, TCP is fairly well behaved. It will not use more than 80% of the uh, bandwidth delay product of your network. Uh, so you know, if, if you're going to face congestion, it will not be because of a whole bunch of TCP sessions or even one very busy TCP session. Um, and that's a mixed blessing. It means you'll be dropping uh, some traffic even though your network is not full in, the, in our design. Uh, I don't worry about that because uh, p production IP networks are almost always uh, built with a lot of headroom. Uh, you know, 50% would be the lowest headroom I've seen on uh, responsible commercial networks. Um, so there's a lot of detail here about exactly how we get that reliable front loss to work. Uh, if you're interested, we'll get into that in Q&A. Um, but I just want to indicate uh, this was the largest single consumer of time during the design phase was to make sure that we got congestion management correct in this design. So one of the tests that you do when you instrument a server is to say, all right, how many queries per second can it answer without my code in it? How many can it answer if my code is in there but it's not turned on? And how many queries per second can it answer if my code is actually uh, recording everything and throwing it away. Uh, so we're sending it not to a disk file, but to dev null. So you're more or less paying the context switch overhead, but you're not paying the, uh, the, the physical storage overhead. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that uh, there is a moderate performance hit, but uh, it is quite manageable. Uh, we're losing anywhere from 5 to 10% 
of your total query per second performance in order to add this instrumentation. Uh, but um, that's, again, most of these name servers have got a lot more headroom than that. So um, this, I think, is a responsible design. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, I will skip that part. These are the message types that we've identified so far. Um, we have various kinds of uh, transactions that we can carry, such as a stub, authoritative, uh, resolver, client, and forwarder transactions. Uh, we're thinking about ways to instrument uh, uh, response rate limiting so that you can see when a bucket is created and when it's destroyed, and also see various things about zone transfers and uh, cache purge and cache expiration. The difference, by the way, between cache purge and expiration is that on a purge, it's because you're trying to store something in a cache that is full. And so you have to find the least recently used element and drop it in order to make room for the next thing that you'd like your caching server to keep. Expiration means that the TTL, the actual DNS time to live field, has expired and it's time to drop it for that reason. So there's two different reasons that something gets evicted from a, a DNS cache. Um, it's open source, as I said. Um, now, we have a commercial interest in this, so uh, I, I want to be very clear about that. Uh, we need all the data uh, from all the DNS servers in the world, and so we want to make this popular so that when we go to somebody and say, uh, can you please uh, trade your data in exchange for various things, uh, that they have a very easy option. Um, but one of the side effects of that commercial interest on our part is that this really will be the ubiquitous uh, lingua franca of the DNS telemetry world, and I expect there to be a, a, a large ecosystem of software able to store this data and index it and report upon it. Uh, and uh, so there, there's likely to be a number of other companies that benefit commercially as well as, uh, you know, the usual open source non-commercial benefits that will accrue from this. Uh, so we've tried very hard to align our commercial interests with everybody else's interests. Um, so, um, yeah, there's more detail here than you need. Um, and I could give you a demonstration of this, but uh, let's see how the time goes in the rest of the slot. Um, so uh, there are some websites that you should visit. Um, the DNSDB website is our passive DNS interface, uh, which also has an API, but dnstap.info you know, contains the slides I've just given, plus an, uh, quite a bit of other information and all the source code that has been released to date. Um, so that would be the, the go-to location if you want to know more about DNS TAP. Um, so that's, that's my talk. Any questions for Paul? In the types and collection buckets that you're getting... Um, Can you state your name? Oh, sorry, Paul Ebersman, Comcast. Um, in the data collection buckets, are you also going to be having ways of collecting other things like views or other esoterica that's obvious to the server but not on the wire? So, yes, except that you mentioned views. Um, <laughs> yes, they so, are evil, but usually necessary. Well, no, um, I invented them, so I don't mind that they are evil. Uh, but the problem is that they are server-specific. So. Um, to the extent that you want a server-specific data element uh, that won't be present in any other uh, any other server, right? Uh, NSD doesn't have views, for example. Correct. Um, then you'll be you'll be using a vendor extension, uh, and that's fine. There is room in the code space for that. It just uh, we're not going to define anything in the base protocol or the base message types that is server-specific in in the way that views is. Uh, so I expect that that means that when my team gets around to porting this code to bind nine and, uh, and so forth, uh, that my team is going to be creating some vendor extensions in ISC's name to represent views. Fair enough. So yes, but no. Ole. No, I'm not. <laughs> oh. No other questions at all? 
I think it must have been something to do, as you were saying earlier, with the beautiful weather outside and folks want to go out and enjoy the warmth and the sunshine rather than being in the room here, listening to interesting talks. No? If not, well, thank you very much for that, Paul. Thanks for your time. So, um, yeah, can you scroll the screen down a little bit so we're just... just can't control this from here. Yes, that's what I wanted. Right, thank you very much. So, that brings us to the end of um, this afternoon's APOP session. Uh, we have another one for you tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. Um, please do arrive in time for that. Um, Again, we've got three speakers. We've got Tony Hain. One is going to be a video recorded presentation because the speaker from LACNIC, Augustine, couldn't be with us. Um, so we've got the recording instead. And Jeff Houston is going to be telling us all about why 512 is important. Or end of the internet, end of the world, I don't remember. Anyway, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. So that's, that's for tomorrow morning, so please don't miss it. Um, there's still more things for you to participate and enjoy this evening. Um, so starting at 5.30, we've got the Network Abuse Buff, which is, oh, I remember my rooms, I think that's next door. Um, here we've got the API v 6 Task Force and V6 Residence Measurement Buff, um, right in here. Um, um, we have the ISOC AU meeting, that's open to everybody as well. That's where I'm heading off to, and I'm going to be talking about internet exchange points and why they're important um, for this part of the world. And in the Connacht room, we have got the youth program, BOF, um, which you're all very welcome to attend as well. Also, OPT are giving away flashing T-shirts. So OPT is one of our sponsors, so they've got T-shirts with little flashing LEDs in them. So if you fancy a T-shirt with a flashing LED, uh, please do rush outside and get one, and thank you to OPT for supplying those. Otherwise, that brings us to the end of the day. Dean will be your chair tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Set your alarm clock, please. And um, just a reminder about the lightning talks. Um, Hopefully we can get some announcement about who the speakers will be at some stage tomorrow. Thanks all very much. Enjoy your evenings. <laughs>